Cool. So welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for being here to this episode of Patch Chat. Um, Patch Chat is a virtual program series that uh, is a partnership between Chicago Ornithological Society and Chicago Audubon Society. Hi, my name is Edward. I am president of Chicago Ornithological Society. Um, and with me, I also have a number of guests here who will be really bringing to bear the best knowledge that there is about what Stan Ridge is all about, how to get there, what to do, and where to find those birds. Uh, so real quick, I would like to introduce uh, my partners here. We've got Stephen DeFalco, who is the director of the Nature Center, of Stan Ridge Nature Center and campus. Uh, we have John Elliott, who uh, actually is a former direct director at the center, right? Or, oh, darn it, you used to work there. <laughs> Point is, he used to work there. He is a long time, uh, you know, birder of the area, area um, is very familiar with its past and the kinds of birding opportunities then how it's changed over time. And we also have Jessica Becker, uh, who is an excellent current birder. You might recognize her from some of her Ask a Bird Nerd programs that she's done with the Cook County Forest Preserves. Um, and I totally forgot to ask what your current role is. I'm a program specialist with the South Zone. Gotcha. So I do all the programming that's not at the Nature Center pretty much, or the campus. All right, so welcome. Big round of applause for our uh, virtual guests here who are going to be dishing here tonight. I think I'm going to go ahead and now turn it over to Stephen, who will kind of give us a really good introduction and rundown on the Sand Ridge campus. Great. Thank you. I have a few slides to um, show. This is taken from a um, larger presentation I have. Um, I recently did a certificate program in creative placemaking, so uh, don't mind the title. <laughs> um, but essentially, just to give you a scope of where within Cook County and the Calumet region we're talking about when we talk about Sand Ridge, um, the white box is Calumet City, a uh, south suburb of uh, Chicago, uh, formerly known as West Hammond. Uh, we're right on the Indiana border. And uh, West Hammond was so nefarious in the bootlegging days that Hammond said, we want nothing to do with this town. You have to change your name. Uh, so that is how they got the name Calumet City. And the red square is um, the campus, uh, Sandridge campus that we'll be talking about. Um, so as we're seeing, uh, there's a ton of great in the Calumet region, uh, larger swaths of green space in this aerial photo, kind of seeing uh, Wolf Lake, Eggers, Powderhorn, uh, a little north of the campus as well as uh, Lake Calumet, uh, some of the Dalton, Burnham, Prairies, and then you got Wampum, Jurgensen to the south. So a really great uh, area ecologically. Um, just to give you a sense of the importance of Sandridge campus in kind of Thorin Township, south suburbs, uh, we are about 90% of the open space in Calumet City. Uh, so this bottom part is uh, Thorn Creek system. So that's Jurgensen, North Creek Meadow, um, also great spots. Uh, like I said, up north, we kind of have that Powderhorn, um, Burnham area. Uh, but yeah, we are the kind of main swath of uh, public green space uh, in the area. So really important. Uh, for all of you, I'm uh, assuming all of you, if not the majority of you, are on eBird, uh, we are an eBird hotspot. Uh, this is just kind of showing you on the map where we are and uh, some of the stats of species that have been logged at the site um, and the checklist and things like that. So um, I was looking at the eBird uh, data before the presentation, and it looked like uh, the first couple entries were actually archival uh, COS entries uh, going all the way back to the early 60s. Uh, and our most frequently uh, logged species, uh, our actually number one logged species is uh, Sandhill Crane at the campus, because uh, we're right in that path of uh, going to further into Indiana at um, the is it Jepson Woods with the platform there? Uh, so we're right in that flight path. Uh, so we always see a good amount uh, 
later into November, early December now, I feel even the three years that I've been director at Sand Ridge, um, when they stop by in the fall has been changing. Um, so what exactly is Sand Ridge Campus? Uh, uh, Jessica Edward will talk about specifics with, uh, within the campus, but just to give you an overarching idea, um, so we have a lot of great assets uh, within the campus, this one square mile uh, swath of land. And we really, in the past, were operating it very independently of each other. Um, the Aquatic Center uh, worked independently of the picnic groves, worked independently of the campground, and independently of the Nature Center. Uh, so in 2017, uh, this idea internally was hatched within the Forest Preserves of Cook County uh, to culminate all of these assets into one holistic um, ecotourism type package for the community and for the general public uh, to better advertise, market, um, and kind of like quantify everything that you can do here. Um, so you can kind of see uh, the bullet points of all the different things that make up the campus. Um, in terms of ecology, our resource management department uh, did a resource management master plan where they essentially took all of our 70,000 acres of land and gave kind of like listed them in, in terms of highest priority um, to lowest priority ecologically. And the campus is part of priority unit number five. Uh, so it's a very interesting site where you have all of this amazing recreational and educational opportunities embedded into one of the most ecologically important and rich areas in all of Cook County. Um, so really a gem, uh, easy to get to right off of I-80 or um, uh, 90, so really easy, or 94, sorry, um, really easy to get to public transit goes right into our front door. Um, these are just some photos of uh, the nature play area and communal area at Camp Shabona Woods. It's a three season campground, so it's open April 1st through the end of October. Um, and we are part of the county's CLIC program, which is Camping Leadership Immersion Course. Uh, so we do a training with group leaders and once they go through that training, they have access to our complete uh, gear library, which includes sleeping bags, sleeping pads, tents, cooking stoves, cooking pots and pans, uh, activity uh, backpacks for your group. Uh, so if anyone is a group leader, adult group or youth group, uh, all are welcome to take advantage of this um, opportunity. We also do a lot of special events at the campgrounds. We offer evening programming to campers on Fridays and Saturdays, Memorial Day through Labor Day. And we do a summer and winter bonfire uh, where we build a bonfire about the size of a pickup truck, uh, have some s'mores, uh, tell some stories, play some music, uh, do some night walks. Uh, it's a really awesome time. And then on the other side, you see Green Lake Family Aquatic Center. There's a lazy river, water slide, um, rentable uh, cabanas for birthday parties and uh, things like that. Uh, so that's a really um, awesome asset that we have as well in the summertime. Uh, we recently went through a grant process uh, through IDNR, Illinois Department of Natural Resources, um, and it is their OSLAD grant. So we got a bunch of funding to essentially remodel all of the public uh, spaces within Sandridge Nature Center. Uh, so this is an overhead and some ex uh, kind of examples of what is in the exhibit room now. Um, so we have all new enclosures. Uh, on the bottom left, we have our Michigan City Road uh, cultural history piece of interpretation going from glaciation to present day. Uh, Michigan City Road uh, is parallel to the Tolston Ridge uh, beach line, uh, which was the last shoreline of ancient Lake Chicago before it finally receded into what is now Lake Michigan. And that high ridge uh, really set the tone for uh, a lot of cultural development in the region from Native Americans all the way um, to present day uh, was used on the Underground Railroad, uh, 
was used with rail lines, Native American trails, um, major point of uh, trans, uh, transporting. Uh, we also see uh, on the right side, we have a giant mural that was done by an artist locally. Uh, we made it into a giant magnet and we have a bunch of magnets that the kids can kind of magnetize. Um, but all the species, all of the plants, animals, all the way down to the fungi that you see on that mural, you can see on our trails um, while you're at Sandridge Nature Center. I put this Visit Chicago Southland link. Um, I won't go to it because I'm already um, running a little uh, short on time, uh, but we partnered with uh, Sh Visit Chicago Southland um, Conservation Visitors Bureau to uh, do a 360 tour um, virtually of the Nature Center and some of our major trailheads around the Nature Center. Um, so you can definitely go to Visit Chicago Southland um, and explore that virtual tour if you're not able uh, to bury your car out of snow and you just want to enjoy uh, the new exhibits uh, for the comfort of your home. Uh, this is the flight room uh, for the birders. On the other side of the exhibit room is our multi-purpose room uh, that we now call the flight room. We have uh, kind of like know your wingspan where you can go up against the wall and see how you measure up to some animals' wingspans, the migration, interp, and then our bird viewing area. Uh, this is our bird garden that is co-managed by the University of Illinois Extension Master uh, Naturalist Group. And then uh, something exciting right next to the uh, Aquatic Center, we partnered with a local school, Wentworth Intermediate in Calumet City, and we're doing a pollinator garden right next to the Aquatic Center. Uh, the deer may have other plans, but uh, they will not crush my spirit to create this pollinator garden. <laughs> um, so in the fall, we did a fall planting uh, with all of their third grade classes, and it's now going to be part of the tradition at Wentworth um, that Every third grader at that school will come to this pollinator garden twice a year, once in the fall, and we'll be talking about biodiversity, using the pollinator garden as a um, kind of visual for that. Um, and then in the springtime, aligning with our curriculum, we'll be talking about life cycles and kind of beneficial insects with the pollinator garden in the spring. Uh, so a really uh, unique kind of thing that we're doing as well. And I'm sure aside from insects, it will bring um, hopefully a lot of birds to that side of the campus as well. Um, and that is that. That kind of goes into another part of my presentation, but that is the main gist of the geographic area and all of the awesome things uh, you can do there year round and seasonally. Um, and with that, I will uh, mute myself and on to the next presenter. Man, it really is a bummer that bald eagles can't eat deer or something like that, man. Anything, any large predatory bird definitely would take it. Thank you, Stephen, for covering all of that. Um, so now I'm gonna pass it over to you, John Elliott. Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for having me back at this. Uh, always is a lot of nostalgia. So basically what you ought to be looking at, let me tell you a little bit. I was at Sandridge Nature Center as a naturalist from January of 1976 to July of 1990 when I moved to River Trail Nature Center. And there I was the director and then I retired from the forest preserves in uh, 2012, going on 10 years almost now. Um, what I had put up was a uh, picture of, uh, why this it says I'm sharing. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, a picture of a couple of wren house, a wren house. We had a, a couple of uh, young part timers there that liked to do creative things. So we had a psychedelically painted house wren house with a house wren visiting it and a house wren that built a nest inside one of the f rail fence post holes um, while I was there. That was just kind of an introduction. So what I want to tell you about a little bit is about what kind of things that we saw there. The first bird that really caught my attention. I was there was we had saw wet owls that roosted in the wintertime in the pine trees out in front of the building. The pine trees were pretty small. The tallest ones when I got there were probably 15 feet high. 
and very dense. It was a perfect place for sawwood owls. And so I have two pictures of sawwood owls here that you can't see of um, them, um, both of them, one in uh, probably 76 and one about 1978 or 80, would sit there and bring a mouse back to their uh, roost for the, sun, for the daytime. And they were so tame, you could walk up there with a, con with a normal lens on a camera and I could actually take a good picture uh, because they would just sit there and let you poke the camera in their face, basically. So that was my kind of introduction to birds at Sand Ridge. I was not uh, at all a birder. I knew plants, sort of, and I concentrated more on plants than birds for my first few years there, getting to know those because I'm not from the area originally. And um, so um, one of the birds that I got to know that I was not familiar with though first on was a pied-billed grebe. We used to see them regularly on the pond there every year. There was a gentleman that would come by every spring, had a very heavy accent. I can't remember where he was from, but he would always come in excited in the spring when he would see his first grebe. He would come in and know the grebes are back. So that was always a good note. One of the things about the pond at Sand Ridge that um, is very curious to me, and I've talked to former naturalists there and people who were there after I was there, and we don't quite know what happened, but the waterfowl list, because I could identify a waterfowl. I couldn't tell a warbler from a vireo in those days, um, but it, I could get to know the waterfowl reasonably well because they're big. And the list of waterfowl that I have in my notes from 1976 through the course of the year, mostly in the spring, included the grebes, the coots, mallards, wood ducks, a pair of black ducks, three lesser scops showed up, ringneck duck, blue wing teal, American widgeon, red-breasted merganser, and redhead. And those birds quit showing up there. By the time I left in 1990, we seldom saw those more unusual ducks on Red Wing Pond. And I have one theory about why it might, part of what might have happened there that I'll mention in a moment. Other birds of note that I had and saw on my list in 1976, we saw a woodcock three different times. On a night hike, we had common snipe um, and we had red poles at the feeder. I would assume that some of those birds might still come around but I, I uh, personally had very few notes of those later on in my time there. By 1977, we had uh, added to the waterfowl list bufflehead, and we had bufflehead show up on the pond for several more years. We saw yellow crowned night herons. They were nesting in the Calumet area still at that time, and we saw them a few times. I had my first long-eared owl sighting there in 1977 and had pictures of one in 1980. And we had long-eared owls with nest in the pines there, or roost in the wintertime in the pines there several years. We also saw them in uh, various other places around Calumet City at that time. And uh, one of my prominent notes for 77 is I wrote down a flock of evening grosbeaks. One of my regrets is not being a particularly efficient naturalist in those days is I didn't keep accurate records. I kept a lot of notes and I have those records, but I didn't keep counts. I didn't keep a lot of specifics. It would have been much more helpful. So you don't see any of my old Sand Ridge observations in eBird because I don't have anything other than checklists. And I suppose maybe I could put them in as just X's, but that's not very helpful sometimes. I do have some uh, eBird lists from some other uh, sites. The other thing I wanted to bring out was uh, I got these two lovely pictures of a uh, cock and hen ringneck pheasants. We had pheasants there regularly. They would come around under the feeders to get back to pick up the, full, the spilled seed. And as late as my last records from 1990, when I left Sand Ridge and I have scattered records from visits after that, we were still seeing uh, nesting ringneck pheasants. I had a note from 1990 before I left in the summer that ringneck pheasants had, a, had chicks up around the North Pond area. Also in 1978-79, uh, we um, saw shovelers, hooded mergansers showed up on the pond. At night hike, we had screech owls and a whippoorwill on our night hike. We had woodcocks again, saw my first harrier there in 78-79. 79 and 80, we saw American bitterns. Um, at uh, North Marsh, I think both times. In 1978, we had a uh, snowy owl, the first snowy owl I ever saw, 
spent a little bit of time perched on a stick out in North Pond, the North Marsh area. North Marsh area. You could see out to uh, across North Marsh, it was a bird observation mound off of Red Wing Trail, east of Red Wing Pond. It became so difficult to keep the vegetation clear that we finally abandoned it before I left there in 1990. But that was, we could see the uh, snowy owl perched out there. And um, about that same time, I don't remember which year, there was a nest of great horned owls that were on a stump, a broken off stump out there that we could photograph at some distance. You're not missing anything by not seeing these photos because they're very poor. And 1980 also, there was, we got good photos of a snowy owl that sat on a rooftop in the neighborhood in South Holland that uh, showed up there for a few days. In 1980, my first note of seeing a Cooper's hawk. Some of you may remember that Cooper's hawks were on the Illinois endangered species list up through the 90s. So seeing one was quite a, a, a treat in 1980. And also in 1980, we found a gray fox dead out on Paxton Avenue. So I don't know if gray foxes ever showed up again. That's the only note of a gray fox set in the area that I have, unfortunately, was a dead one. Some other little things of kind of interest, um, mentioning you would like to see bald eagles getting uh, catching deer. Well, we were pretty excited in 1979. We had the first records of deer being on the property at all, and we found some tracks. Um, the first coyote that we saw was in 1984. We had a record of somebody seeing one on the property. Uh, it was our director at that time, Ed Lace. And then my first one I saw in the area was caught in a snare down south of us uh, in one of the uh, Thorn Creek preserves. Somebody had set an illegal snare up and had caught one in a snare, which unfortunately it had to be euthanized. It was so badly damaged. If you looked at my uh, thought about that waterfowl list that I rattled off to you, something that was missing, Canada geese. I have records of Canada geese flying over for every year that I was there up until 1982, when the first ones I have records of actually landing anywhere at the center property. Um, the first goslings from anywhere in the area that I have were in 1983 out at what is now Bartell Grassland. And the first goslings at Sand Ridge were in either 85 or 86. So there are some changes that have been going on. Um, it seemed like when we saw the first coyotes in 84, but we didn't start to see numbers of them for some years after that. And it would seem like the disappearance of pheasants is time to the increase of coyotes. That seems to make sense as uh, pheasants being ground nesters. The other note, I did uh, started doing Christmas counts at Kickapoo Woods. I wanted to mention that because that was very exciting for Christmas counts. I didn't get a lot of birds, but I saw pheasants there several times. They were the winters for the early 80s that I uh, did Christmas counts over there. And um, in December of 1978, I found four Bob White quail at Kickapoo Woods. And they showed up in the area until December of 1981 in Calumet Woods, the Christmas count that year showed 15 over at Calumet Woods. And those woods, Kickapoo and Calumet are just over along Halstead and Ashland Street, just west of the Nature Center, if you're not familiar with the area. Um, I did my first spring bird count at Sandridge Prairie Nature Preserve in 1980, and I had 37 species on my list. Uh, nothing too unusual. Eight species of warbler, but by that time I sort of could identify warblers. Um, um, that's about all I wanted to say about my historical area there. If you have questions, put them in the chat and I can try to uh, help with that later on. So thanks for that. Okay, so even without photos, some of these stories are just killing me right now. Um, but the one, the one that really got me was we, I've been thinking for years that Sand Ridge is the perfect habitat for whippoorwill, but obviously we don't see them or hear them anymore. But that was something you guys consistently had? Not consistently so much. We, okay. uh, we did see, I, I only had the one record. We saw the woodcock pretty regularly. We would to stir them up on night hikes. The other thing I wanted to mention that I forgot about that whole question about waterfowl on the pond, and I don't know what kind of records there are out there now, Stephen and you and Jessica can uh, fill me in on that. 
but the pond surroundings were much more open. And um, in fact, I had these great records of the flowers. I was really into flowers. There was an open strip on the backside of the pond when you looked across the Red Wing Trail that was just loaded with wildflowers. And by the time I left in 1990, that had all grown over and, and the trees had gotten much bigger and the brush had gotten much bigger. And one guess, totally a guess, is that the waterfowl just didn't find it as an attractive a place. It was, the window was too small for them to come in on it. I don't know if anybody can, can elaborate on that or tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> oh, so I, um, one of our, our main uh, regional ecologists, uh, Dan Spencer, that I work with a lot, um, we've kind of come to a similar conclusion uh, with shoreline, where the brush that has um, kind of really taken hold, especially on the Red Wing south end of the Red Wing pond, um, has essentially eliminated any like gradual shoreline, that that has a big impact on it as well. Because um, what we see, especially with the egrets and the heron, is they'll all be on the south end at Dogwood. And then if Dogwood dries up, then they'll all go to Red Wing, where I think there was one time we counted uh, 47 egrets all in the trees. So when you were on Red Wing and you were looking across the pond, like the whole canopy was all white <laughs> from all the egrets uh, on a really dry, day when they they did they weren't dogwood was, was essentially a glorified mud flat that day so they were all up at red wing but yeah um we've we've kind of said that brush um eliminating that gradual shoreline uh, may have something to do with it that's a really interesting I'm glad to hear that that somebody and then i respect dan quite a bit so that's nice to hear that he's uh, agreed with that because i never talked to him about it uh, but it, it was really, we tried very hard as, as a, to keep that open on the south side for a while and it just got overwhelming and there was some really cool flowers there. Just point out that all of those flowers were planted in there. That was a man-made pond. You probably maybe didn't mention that, but all of the, the dogwood marsh is natural marsh, but Red Wing Pond and North Pond were, were dug out uh, when the Nature Center was created. I could go on about some of that at some point. Um, and so all of those flowers, there was really cool wildflowers back there that had been planted and we just, to see them go was really sad, but we couldn't keep, keep ahead of it. But we never saw egrets in those numbers either. I think the uh, egrets we were, were rare uh, for us to see there. Great blue herons, green herons, we saw the night herons occasionally, but egrets were quite unusual, so. All yeah, right. you mentioned, oh, I was going to say really quickly, ahead, um, John mentioned uh, kind of the fox and some usual, unusual mammals as well. Um, and Sand Ridge, um, in my conversations with Anchor, um, if memory serves, uh, Sand Ridge was the first sighting of uh, river otters re-entering Cook County. Um, and we still have mink occasionally on the Lost Beach Boardwalk. Um, and for anyone who needs a, a, we have a we have a turkey on exhibit. Um, so I don't know in, in your counts if that counts or not, but he does have a friend, another Tom, uh, that's been hanging out at the center for the past year. Uh, so if you want to check off wild turkey on your list, uh, you can come down. Well, that's certainly a big change too, because obviously, and not obviously maybe, but to all, all of us who have been looking at birds for years. Turkeys were nowhere anywhere near us in those days. But um, yeah, I, I put in the, the one for the Christmas count. I'm the compiler for the count, Christmas count. That's about the only time I ever get down there anymore, which is too bad, but uh, living in Oak Park, it's a ways. But um, with the turkey, yeah, I thought it, I, I checked with the Forest Preserve naturalist uh, staff the wildlife house and they said, yeah, it's probably not. But uh, our counter out on the far south end of our circle down by Glenwood found 11 of them on count day. So they should be pretty easy to go down and find, I would think. I haven't been down there to check it out myself. So we got a dozen turkeys on our Christmas count uh, this year. Oh, on the turkeys at Glenwood? There have been out there almost every day, and there's at least 23 that I've counted. Oh. Wow. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, it, it's a nice flock. It's hard to imagine, but they're out there walking along either next to Main Street, they're walking in the street, or they're walking around the parking lot. I mean, I guess it makes sense. The habitat is great for them there, but it's still surprising. Yeah, it's very surprising. Well, yeah. they've, been, they've been moving up from Will County. They've been in Will County now for quite a few years, and everybody's been anticipating that sooner or later they'd be moving up into South Cook County. And of course, that's quite a ways from Will County yet down there, but yeah, that was a couple of years. There was one at Bobian Woods, and everyone was saying, "Oh, no way! Someone released this. Like, this, is, <laughs> this turkey isn't really here." <laughs> yeah, that turkey at Bobian Woods was like the first turkey seen in the city limits in like at least fifty years. And I was going to say that year that that turkey showed up, all of a sudden it seemed like there were turkeys everywhere. Like there was one in like downtown Evanston, I feel like, and a few other ones that I'm like, where did all these turkeys just come from? Like, yes, we anticipated them to move in, but I don't think we expected them to all just appear. <laughs> and how did the, they get to Bobian? Well, the funniest the part about that too is that it's like, it went from, yeah, like you said, you know, one turkey at like Bobian and one at Rainbow and everybody lost their minds. They're like, oh my God. And then basically immediately afterwards, I was like, oh, okay. So this is, this is a thing now. Like we're used to it. Hey, if for Calumet, so much wildlife, I, I attribute to the rail lines. Those rail lines, the coyotes use them like their own personal highways, and they're not the only ones that take advantage of those little greenways. Um, and then uh, we we didn't get any um, data in this past year, but I want to say 2019, right off the parking lot, we had a nesting pair of Cooper's Hawk um, right in between the parking lot and Pines Trail, um, just south of the Nature Center. Uh, so that that was fun. It was also fun, not so fun, uh, more interesting to see the Cooper's Hawk uh, flush out the, the poor bird feeders, uh, <laughs> feeding feeding the little ones and all the public saying, oh my gosh, why is that Cooper's Hawk doing that? And it's like, well, the Cooper's Hawk figured out. Cooper's Hawk just sits on the fence, waits for the bird feeders to get full, flushes out the bird feeders and um, but yeah, seeing that nesting pair so close to the parking lot was really cool that one year. So hopefully they come back. Well, on that note, the first destination Jessica and I are going to talk about is the feeders. <laughs> so let me pull up my uh, super jank slideshow here. Um, can everybody see that? All yeah. good? Okay, cool. So yes. This is a uh, awesome generic photo that I pulled off of uh, Google of Sand Ridge Nature Center. Uh, if you guys have never been there, it's gorgeous. It's a beautiful little building here. Um, and this is Jessica and I. Um, we, <laughs> we are probably some of the most frequent birders at this point of Sand Ridge and, and probably have birded it more than most people at this point in, in uh, modern times. Um, I worked previously at Sand Ridge for a number of years as a naturalist. Um, there you can see I was doing my Halloween program uh, dressed as Woody. And uh, Jessica, you want to tell a little bit about yourself? How long you've been at Sand Ridge, et cetera? South yeah. Zone? So, hi guys, I'm Jessica. Uh, I do work for the Forest Preserves. Um, I started there in 2015, uh, but I do not work directly out of Sand Ridge Nature Center. Um, I do a lot of the programming, including bird walks kind of all around the preserves that aren't the center. So you catch me a lot at Eggers doing bird walks too, or um, Burnham Prairie and sometimes um, out further west, like Orland or McGinnis Slough. But yeah, when I'm there, I'm definitely always birding. I feel like one time I forgot my binoculars and I was so sad. I had to borrow a pair and it's just not the same when you borrow a pair but no, no. uh this photo of me is from 2014 uh when I had just graduated college and that's me and a little shrew uh while I was in Kenya studying before I was like super into birds and I thought mammals were going to be my thing and then I came over to the right side obviously and we are very thankful that you finally <laughs> saw the light <laughs> um as I mentioned, I used to work at Sand Ridge. I no longer work there anymore, but during that time, that was obviously 
when I cut my teeth on learning just how amazing Sand Ridge is, is as a burning location and obviously still go back all the time whenever I can. Um, humble brag, I am totally the top e-birder for Sand Ridge. Um, actually, that's not humble at all. Uh, and I dare anybody here to dethrone me as the top e-birder at Sand Ridge because that means you guys are burning the heck out of it. And you know what? This site deserves it. And we're going to go in a little bit about why and how. So here's a map. If you guys are familiar with the Forest Preserve website, there is actually a really fantastic uh, digital map on there. It's just maps.fedcc.com. Um, and it's right there on the homepage. It's a really great resource for any of the preserves in Cook County that you wouldn't want to see. But I literally just screen grabbed this off of that website here. So this is the campus, as Stephen was telling us about at the beginning here. And you've got, uh, you know, the Nature Center itself, the big chunk on the left with all those trails there. You've got Green Lake, the big chunk on the right, the Sand Ridge Nature Preserve, which is up on the top right there. Um, this is the campus here. Um, and you can see these four colored trails here. Those are the kind of the main areas that Jess and I, Jessica and I are going to tell you about because those are the areas where you're, if you're gonna if you're gonna come here and get the birds, that's where you want to be. And here's a satellite view, and you can see those are the trails. Again, this information is all online on their website as well. But those are the trails. Those are, those are their distances. So, I mean, let's talk about the nature center first here. Um, it's, it's a Groundhog Day, so I, I had to stick this one in here, obligatory Groundhog, uh, but obviously the center is a host to a ton of amazing wildlife beyond just birds, so keep your eyes peeled. For example, this Groundhog, who used to hang out around the feeders when I was there um, and just bum around underneath the feeders eating seeds and climbing up trees. Um, but, I mean, are there any other wonky mammals that you've seen, Jessica, <laughs> bumming off the feeders? I always see deer there. I yep. don't know how deer being so big seem to sneak up on the bird feeder. I'll like turn to, or to do something on my laptop and I'll look up and I'll be like, my God, where did all these deer come from? Uh, the birds seem pretty used to it though, which is kind of funny. They're down there eating the seed just with the birds. And then there was a possum that would hang out there during the day. That was always a little out of place. To say the least. <laughs> You're like, okay, cool. I'm not going to question it, but right. thank God. Free food. I mean, we'd all be there. Yeah, I mean, right. Can you blame them? And <laughs> Lord knows uh, the senator does a really great job of providing free food for birds, not people. That's a different thing entirely. Uh, but for as far as the birds are concerned, I mean, uh, the staff do a great job of filling up a wide variety of feeders in that bird garden there. Several suet feeders, several hopper feeders. Um, if you go to the room that Stephen was showing earlier with like the spread wingspan classroom situation there, out those windows is that bird garden and um, the feeders are pretty darn close to these windows so you can get some excellent looks um, at some of the birds they can find out there and then you know a lot of you know the common usual suspects that come to feeders but you get the whole gamut um, from the diff several different woodpecker species, several sparrow species, blue jays, cardinals, uh, all, all the jam, all your jams, um, and I think especially right now, personally, I think these winter birds are the most fun. So these are just some of the winter photos that I've taken. I especially love that one on the top left where the morning dove is photo bombing all the other birds, just kind of stuck its head up in there. Um, but I mean, personally, I, some of the best birding, honestly, I've done at Sand Ridge has been at the feeders, which is great because it's just right off the parking lot. It's right there at the center itself. Um, I mean, some of my favorites have been, yeah, you know, the uh, that, that awesome fox sparrow that hung out basically all winter one year. I've had both red and white breasted nuthatches. Tufted titmice come like the we don't have a ton of titmice in my experience at Sand Ridge, but the ones that are there, they're at the feeders. Um, if you wait long enough, you'll get them. Any other kind of things that you think are really highlights of the feeders? Yeah, the, I mean, the tufted titmice. Sometimes you can't get them during the spring and summer very easily, but you can at Sand Ridge because they're always at the feeders, I feel like. Um, yeah, and just earlier this year, there was the red, red breasted nuthatch. I'm trying to think. I pulled up my list, but of course I can't remember everything I saw. I was hoping for a red pole while I was there, but alas, no. I sat out there like, all eight hours I was working, nothing. 
It's going to happen. This is the year. It's got to happen, right? That's what I think, but I don't know. But yeah, your basic birds, you can start your checklist and get all the easy ones off. I think this is the only place that I've ever seen a pileated at Sandridge as well. Uh, Pileated woodpecker made a cameo at the feeder area. They, they clearly aren't common in the area, but they are passing through. And the one that I ever saw at Sand Ridge in all my years there was here in the bird garden. And uh, obviously, shout out to, again, more of those mammals. That was a, There was actually a, an albino possum out there at least one winter that I was working there. Odd little one. Came almost every day. And that uh, turkey will come under the feeders, too, if you wait. Um, when it's not hanging out with its turkey friend, it comes and gets a snack. So get it all off your list while sitting nice and warm inside, which I do appreciate. Yeah, right? You don't even need binoculars. You just hang out, sit in the bench, stay toasty. <laughs> we, we've, we've, unfortunately, we can't promise you pheasants anymore, mm-hmm. uh, but, you know, we can, we can give you guys turkeys as compensation for <laughs> whatever ecological changes are going on there and, and entrance of coyotes to the picture. So, Sand Ridge is a huge place. Um, the campus in general is huge, but the Nature Center is also pretty darn big. Um, so there are four main trails, as we pointed out earlier. So Jessica and I are going to basically kind of break down trail by trail. What are the highlights of these trails here? And what can you expect to look for? Where should you go? So kind of looking for the south here. So we've got the main parking lot, the, you know, the, the sort of red sign there in, on the left is where the entrance is. You come in, you park, and that sort of little gold bar is where the center is. So obviously you're gonna start there, you're gonna go to the bathroom, fill up your water bottle, check out the bird feeders. And then personally, I think no matter how long you intend to stay, whether you're gonna do like a full day of birding or you just need to do a quick blitz to get your lunch break bird fix, um, I always think the best place to start is the green trail. It's a little hard to see, but that green trail, which is Pines Trail, it's also the shortest trail, the dirt trail, but it's pretty awesome. Um, And I mean, first and foremost, this is the kind of the prairie that sits in the middle of that trail. The whole trail kind of does a loop around it. And if you time it right, this place is bananas with flowers. I mean, beyond just the birding is great. This place has so many fantastic spring ephemerals. It's like a a mid-May walk walk through there is just bliss. Um, Can't even begin to describe the numbers out there, but... um, it's a nice, easy, short trail, and you're just going to want to take a stroll around it. And I mean, you know, we got pretty much, I feel like if you're going to get your slam of fall and spring and fall warblers, this is the trail to do it. There's a lot of really old growth oaks in there and some kind of middle canopy as well. Every warbler that I've gotten at Sand Ridge, I've gotten at least once on this trail. And in many cases, if it's, say, the only the time that I've seen that warbler, I've seen it on the Pines Trail. Pines Trail is where you see these. Um, So as you can see, like this really crappy photo of mine of a black-throated blue. In my defense, this is crappy because that was taken when I had a flip phone. Um, So that tells you just how darn close that thing was and how close to the ground it was. And this was mentioned earlier, but with the return of Cooper's Hawks, this is namesake, this is where all those pines that John was talking about earlier have now grown up to be giant pines, no longer 10 foot, 15 foot trees, but we're talking 40, 50 foot trees. Um, and they no longer host sawwood owls, but they do host sometimes nesting Cooper's hawks. And I was lucky enough one year to actually be out there and get, uh, a, again, crappy, but passable image showing some of those fluff balls up in there. Any other comments about Pines Trail? There were, I don't remember if it was last year or 2020, a pair of red-shouldered hawks that were hanging out in that same oh, yeah. kind of stand of pines. It it seemed like they were gonna nest, but I don't think I don't think they did. And if they did, they didn't do it successfully. So uh, yeah, the pines are really good cover for some of those larger birds too but it does have that nice low brush which uh, is one thing I like about dogwood which I assume is going to be the next trail is it's nice and easy to see warblers and vireos because they're pretty much right at eye level for once. So next up is dogwood. If you can't afford the time 
uh, this might be the best a single kind of spot and trail to get to if you can, uh, mostly because of that. If you head down, um, going southwards, they see there's kind of like a little offshoot towards this wet area here. There's a boardwalk there, a small boardwalk and observation platform. Um, and it looks like this. It's a beautiful set. I mean, personally, it was an area where I used to go on my lunch breaks and just hang out because it's quiet, it's scenic, um, but it also has a lot of fantastic birds. And a big part of it is because if you can kind of see on the satellite map, there's that damp spot there that the purple kind of goes around. Um, it's an interesting wetland because most years, not every year, but most years, it's not a permanent wetland. It does dry up late into the summer. Um, but that's part of its superb charm because basically all through kind of the spring, it's wet. And so you get all kinds of waterfall in there and it stays pretty shallow. It never gets much deeper than I want to say like what, three, maybe four feet at most. Um, and so you get all kinds of waterfowl and herons out there. Uh, warblers love it. I always get indigo buntings out here. Usually there's a raptor hanging out somewhere nearby. Uh, but as time goes on, it starts to kind of dry up. There's no clear inlet or outlet for it. It's basically kind of a sort of temporary marsh. And by the time you get to like July, that's when you start seeing those heron numbers really rack up, kind of like what Stephen was saying with those egrets. I mean, you can get some really awesome heron numbers out here in this area. And they're all just kind of strolling through the low water there. Um, you can kind of see on that photo on the bottom left, um, barely a foot deep, sometimes inches deep, just picking off small fish and frogs hanging out in that area. Jessica, you got more on Dogwood Trail? I was just excited because last year when I was out there, I got a really good close look at a wide-eyed vireo um, because they had been doing some restoration back there and there were brush piles like really close to the trail. It was kind of like tucked in there. I think it thought I couldn't see it, but I totally could. Um, and that's what's nice about those trails is you know, we all get warblers neck by the end of the spring, but it's nice if you can kind of relax and see out across the brush instead of having to look way up in the air. Um, and uh, wear bug spray. <laughs> yes. Always. Yes. Like, even if you went there today, bug spray. No, but it's really mosquito-y. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's important to note that, you know, talking about Dogwood Trail in particular, um, this is a very wet, soggy trail, even during dry days. Um, there are portions of the trail that if the water's high enough just gets washed out if it's a really rainy day. Um, so this is not a trail, if you go just straight to the boardwalk, it's fine, right? That's a you know, relatively elevated dirt trail, but the rest of it, you really should not be tempting without at least some kind of waterproof footwear, at least up to your ankles, um, sometimes your knees, depending on the day. Uh, and that whole kind of southern quarter of the preserve is a extremely wet, wet woods. Um, I mean, there's ponds and pools and puddles all throughout that zone there um, that that find that whole area. So it's really great habitat. I think, uh, you know, part of the issue that bugginess has led to, I think the biggest flock I've ever seen of rusty blackbirds um, just hanging out on one of those pond edges. But yeah, it's very mucky in there, but it also means you get cool things like this. You know, this is the perfect habitat. Sand Ridge, the Green Lake, these areas where they have these really dense woods that are defined by these, you know, heavy wetlands that fill through all, all of them. I mean, they're really great. There's tons of wood ducks out there, which are good eating for these guys. And goes to the back also to you, just as Jessica was saying about those red-shouldered hawks. I have yet to find where that is, but I'm like, 99% certain they're nesting somewhere on campus too. Maybe if it's not in that pine grove, it's some other corner of the preserve, but we see them every year now, uh, adults and juveniles. They're around, they're nesting. It's the perfect habitat for them. All right, I guess looking at the north side now. So if you go north of the Nature Center, first things first, hit up just the gardens immediately around the center. Um, I find that there's the, they have um, a little bit of a, a, a butterfly garden with a nice little pool back there. It's an artificial pool, but those are the best looks of hummingbirds I have ever gotten, personally. They love to come to that fountain. Um, any other highlights of the garden there? 
not for birds, but if you are somebody who likes photography, dragonflies and butterflies are there galore. Um, and they sit pretty still, all things considered. But, but yeah, the hummingbirds, if you haven't had one yet for the year, nice, easy one to get. It's a pretty nifty spot for them. Now, if you're looking at this map, uh, you'll notice the large kind of, I don't know, teardrop shaped pond. Uh, that's the pond, uh, that's Red Wing Pond. That was the big waterway that John was referring to earlier that tended to have a high degree of waterfowl. And yeah, I, I, I think we can both confirm that it does not host that array of waterfowl anymore. I mean, we still get the grebbies, um, but I don't think I've ever had any of those major diving ducks like scop or redheads or mergansers out there. I never thought that it was even deep enough for most diving ducks. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still a great little pond. And yes. I think, well, I was lucky enough actually to see the otter that Stephen was talking about before it eventually picked up and left. And I believe they tracked it all the way down to actually um, Black Partridge Woods on the Southwest side of the county. but. Uh, I'm pretty sure he just like completely cleaned that pond out of fish and turtles. <laughs> I'd be surprised if there was anything left living in that pond when that otter was done. Um, so it's not a huge body of water, but it does get the occasional waterfowl. And personally, uh, I don't know if this is the case for you, Jessica, or other birders, but personally, when I see the red-shouldered hawks, this is where they see them, usually sitting on like the dead ash trees and stuff hanging out around the edges of this pond. Yeah, I see them by those pine trees right off the parking lot, but I mean, that's pretty close to the pond. It's still, yeah, it's pretty <laughs> darn close. So vicinity of the center is yeah. where you should be looking for them. Um, Red Wing Trail, there's the blue trail there, and that's a good one in general to keep in mind because that is the trail that is packed gravel. So if you do know somebody or personally have a, any uh, mobility issues, that's going to be the easiest trail for you to be able to still go out and explore and enjoy the site. Um, and then as you can kind of see the whole area there, basically between that red trail and the blue trail, I mean, that is all just one big basin of mush of water, vegetation, um, and I call it the, the, the ginormous cattail marsh uh, because it really is mostly that. It is a huge, huge marsh with cattails. I'm just going to put it out there on the record. It's being recorded that if that ever gets burned, if any day the forest preserves manage to get out there and burn that whole big marsh off, it is the duty of the Sand Ridge staff to let the birding community know because I'm calling it right now, that is gonna be a shorebird bonanza. It's this big pan of shallow water. I don't think it ever gets any deeper than two feet of water in there. It's super shallow and extensive, but it's just chock full of cattails. And so if you could beat some of that back with a good flame, whew, that's, that's, that's my prediction. So yeah, Red Wing Trail um, and heading into Lost Beach Trail, which is the longest trail. Personally, I did not hit it nearly as much because it's so darn long, but I think that's a thing that plagues it in general is most people don't tend to not take it. And there's a lot of birding still to be done there. I think there's a lot of things that have yet to be seen, frankly. Yeah, I can't say I've been back there very much um, because it is long. So if you're you know, for us going out on your lunch, you don't have time to bird much, but there is um, a part of the boardwalk that comes right along um, Red Wing Pond. And before you get to like the red loop on the map, it's that kind of string coming off. Um, that's nice. I've had um, redheaded woodpeckers pretty close and um, a couple other, you know, it's good for swallows and some other kind of marshy flyers. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to bird it nearly as much as I would like to, but I've definitely, the areas where I have definitely seen woodcocks doing breeding displays is all along Lost Beach Trail. So I know they're up there. Um, and I mean, obviously if you get out there at the right time, it's fantastic for warblers too, because that entire Northern portion where the red loops, I mean, are some of the most beautiful black oak forests I've ever seen. Tons of sassafras growing in there. I mean, 
it really are some amazing woodlands. And honestly, yeah, that's another one too. If there were ever whipper wells back at Sand Ridge, I mean, I'd, I'd put money on that's where they would appear in that northern portion there where it's very sandy. You're standing on the ancient sand dunes, tons of old black oaks, maybe someday. Right, and Stephen put it in the chat, but the trail says that it's like 1.4 miles, but you end up doubling back on yourself. So it really ends up being closer to two because you do one part of the trail twice. So uh, you're definitely getting your workout in. Yeah, well, because you're like, oh, 1.5 miles, I can do that, no problem. And then you're out there and you're like, wait a minute, where am I? <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> Um, but yeah, these are just some of the crappy photos that I've taken of some of the birds up there. I mean, bluebirds love these trails. Uh, you, Jessica mentioned redhead woodpecker. Um, they tend to be pretty strong on that site in general. Um, yeah, some of these marshes here do make way for things like Sora and Virginia rail if you get lucky. Um, I will throw this one out here. This was a random one. I don't know if you can tell from that really dump of a photo, but that is a horned grebe that I saw out in Red Wing Pond there. And I was like, oh my God, this is gonna be like the coolest waterfall I've ever seen out here. Um, <laughs> otherwise it's always every pied bull grooves, but that was the one horn grebe I saw once. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> I think we should just start calling them grebbies. I kind of like that. I mean, I'm down with that. <laughs> Go full literal. Some calling yellow throats here. Very, very common at Sand Ridge. Um, so zooming out a little bit, I know we're going over a little time here, but just zooming out a little bit, beyond the nature center itself and those key trails, there are several other areas where you can go to get some really good birding in. Um, one of the big ones is just to the right, that other big chunk uh, just to the east there, Green Lake Savannah. As you can kind of see from the satellite map, most of it is the same habitat as Sand Ridge. I mean, you can kind of see those sort of wetlands and ridges coming through where the forests and old geographic features uh, are. The only thing separating them is just torrents, which blazes right between the two. Um, but still a lot of really fantastic habitat. And I want to say that there was actually recently a lot of restoration work done in there, wasn't there? Yeah, so we've got a lot. Part of Oslad was a $30,000 restoration budget um, for the southwest portion of the campus but we get a lot of grant work with Friends of the Forest Preserves that does a lot of work in what we call Green Lake Savannah, which is that area north of the Green Lake parking lot. Um, Cause yeah, we, we share a similar sandy soil topography uh, to Northwest Indiana more so than the rest of Cook County. Uh, so you can definitely see that dune and swale ecology uh, really shine through with these aerial photos. Yeah, that especially pops then in that section to the northeast as well, the Sand Ridge Nature Preserve, which is an Illinois State Nature Preserve, one of the like highest designations for habitat quality around. Um, you can kind of see those lines where the forests sit on the ancient dunes there. Um, that's another spot where, because there's not really like a public access point or clear parking, I, a lot of people don't really go there, but the birding is very much equivalent uh, to especially that northern portion of the nature center. Um, a lot of great warbler viewing, a lot of great, uh, you know, shorebirds, and if there's been a good burn in some of those wet areas, um, it's definitely an area that deserves some love. And then I want to kind of bring your attention over to the map on the right, which is even a little farther zoomed out, and kind of the immediate vicinity of sort of the campus there, which you can see dead center of that map. But you can also see that red line on the right side there, on the um, easternmost side, that's um, the Burnham Greenway, um, not to be confused with the Burnham Greenway that's actually in South Shore Chicago, but it is a Burnham Greenway and it actually connects several fantastic habitats and it's not easily apparent on this map here, but you got on the far north end of that red there, you've got Calumet City Prairie, which is also an Illinois Nature Preserve. Um, a little farther south, you've got Wentworth Prairie, the sort of next little red sign that you see there, which is also a really great little wet prairie. And then farther south, there's a actually land and water reservoir. It's not pictured on the map here, but it exists just south of Wentworth. Um, and then even farther down, there's a cemetery south of that, which leads into those Calumet Woods right on the Indiana border there. I mean, there's a ton of actually very contiguous habitat here that's really just kind of separated by a couple of roads that really all add up to a really big chunk of green space overall, where there's a lot 
to potentially see. And if you go on eBird, almost all of these places have like zero records. And that's not because, you know, they don't have birds. It's just because they're areas that people aren't really exploring. Jessica, yeah, this, do you have any others on these, some of these? Yeah, just the south side of the county in general and this Calumet area, it's, I feel like through other like COS presentations, it seems like it used to be fairly heavily birded and then it just kind of stopped. And, it, you know, with all the industry and stuff moving in, people kind of stopped going, but um, they still got some really good stuff out there. And someone's got to be out there on the lookout for the yellow headed blackbirds if and when they come back, <laughs> yes. right? I'm still hopeful. Or, geez, I'm, the Eggers yellow crowned night herons, man. Yeah, Eggers has a ton of restoration going on. So I'm like, yeah, maybe in like five to 10 years, this should be fine. But um, yeah, I certainly recommend it. I know it's outside, again, of the realm of what most people are used to. Um, I, they're not some of the most highlighted preserves that you see on Facebook, but they're great. And Sandridge is cozy and generally pretty quiet because there's not that many people out there well now there will be because all of you guys are gonna go <laughs> and tell but, all your friends you know you go to little red schoolhouse or like river trail nature center and sometimes it's packed and you can't yeah. get a good look at the birds so sand ridge always good for birding you know i think one of the things too that's um that's interesting to kind of point out is you know sand ridge is probably never gonna be anything like Montrose. I think even after it's been fully birded so to speak you know we're not gonna have a list of 350 but um, I remember when, I think it was my first year on the job, we did the, like that bird, the preserves competition, where, like a whole bunch of different preserves had their sort of teams and I was trying to build up the biggest species list. And Sand Ridge came in in a very respectable middle. I think we were like ninth or something. Um, but one of the things that's really neat to highlight is just because the habitat is so solid, even if you're not gonna be racking up the most ridiculous species lists, some of the sheer abundance sometimes more than makes up for it. You could be out there, you know, um, in some places like, I, I don't know, a random park and see one great crested flycatcher and be like, wow, that's so amazing. You go to Sand Ridge, you walk 10 feet and you get like five just calling at each other all at once, which is not something you can say of a lot of preserves uh, and parks in the Chicagoland area. Agreed. All right. Well, question time, right? Let's see. Um, okay, we, hopefully we answered that question about where Dogwood is. Um, seeing a lot, of, a lot of good comments here about the ma map. Yeah, good, good. Um, oh, neat. I didn't know Pines was slated to become ADA accessible. That'll be cool. Yeah, that so we just, it. yeah, we just worked with P&D last year and Pines Trail as well as from Pines to the boardwalk uh, to make the overlook ADA accessible as well. All right. And also, I know this is a bird thing, but my favorite tree is on the Dogwood Boardwalk. Uh, there are bald cypress uh, for Chicago. Yes. It like shouldn't be there, but it's there and it works. And I love them. <laughs> I mean, if we're tree nerding, I appreciate just that weird random grove of aspens that are growing on the Lost Beach Trail. We've got a colony of aspen trees up there. There's also yeah, uh, trees black gums on Lost Beach Trail. The black gums still thriving up there? Um, they're not thriving, um, but they're there. Uh, we <laughs> got back in 2019, uh, we got some really big storm surges uh, going through. Uh, the campus area and Dogwood and Lost Beach saw, you know, whole oaks with the sandy soil, just root ball and all just completely uproot themselves. Um, so very sad to see. Um, we were kind of very nervous to see what the microbursts uh, could potentially be from opening up that much canopy. Um, but we've done a really good job with Troy and resource management on kind of um, getting crews out to uh, mitigate some of that but yeah so things are still intact but uh, there was definitely some times in the fall when the vegetation went down that some people actually got lost on Lost Beach Trail because they lost the trail. <laughs> That's easy to do. I just might throw out there real quickly that with the black gummas if not the most one of the most northern natural uh, stands of black gum in the country 
they're mainly a southern tree. And there's also, it, it's sand, one of the things that makes that whole area so special, it's very much an ecological crossroads with the, the dune country that's more affinitive to Indiana, those uh, the black gum, the southern species. And so it, it does add to that diversity, makes it such a wonderful place. For sure. And I think, you know, once again, I think a lot of that, um, some of these areas are just not super well traveled. And I think that probably be a lot more reflected even just in the kinds and diversity of birds that you're going to get in some of these areas. Um, if you're willing to hike for them, they're there. There's a lot of texture in the landscape that can support a lot of different species. <laughs> yes, May 14th, World Migratory Bird Day. Um, I will also point out that uh, beyond this program, which was kind of like a good sort of uh, start to the season here, we have several, uh, Chicago Ornithological has several hikes scheduled through the year um, at coming up at Sand Ridge, spring, summer, fall, to really try to highlight some of that seasonal diversity. So I think those are already posted on our website. So if you want to go and check those out and sign up, um, please do so. We'll be out there showing you in real life, um, some of these spots we talked about today. <laughs>